Okay. So let's just start with the case. Pretty much you have a patient, 74 years old, it's a male, it's 430. Um, you only know, and this is not uncommon to happen, it's, this is not just a simple case, it's actually a real one. And unfortunately, you're going to see patients that just get into your ICU without an MRI because they just get transferred from somewhere else. But you just know that this patient is heavy smoker, 40 pack year. <coughs> and obviously, you can tell that the patient is morbidly obese. The patient can barely tell you that the patient is short of breath. And then it's going to take like five minutes, but then they're going to hook up the patient to the monitor. And this is what you get. What do you see? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say about, I, I wouldn't say hypotension, but I would say maybe borderline if you want to say so, but that's fine. Um, yeah. So definitely this is not normal, but to my eyes, it's not completely abnormal to keep a patient or to have a patient in the ICU. I mean, some mild tachypnea, mild tachycardia, that's fine. You can have a patient with fevers and having kind of the same. You guys having fevers, you're going to get the same vitals, right? Not just because of that, you're going to get the patient in the ICU. But the point I'm trying to make here is that I received many phone calls about these things uh, from the ER or from the wards that they give me exactly the same vitals or I can see them on EPIC and still I feel the patient may not need the ICU. However, it comes to this thing, inspection. You have to go and see your patient. It's extremely important, at least for this uh, point I'm trying to make. Flare nostrils, it has been better described actually on pediatric patients, but on adults you can see it too. Use of accessory muscles, I don't need to tell you which accessory muscles, and how your abdomen is moving on inspiration, which is supposed to go upwards normally, but if you go downwards, that's a problem. So you have a guy who's having a breathing rate of 22, but with all those three things. The patient is on severe respiratory distress. Your respiratory rate may not be that bad, and somebody may have called you because of this, and you may have said, you know, the patient is fine. That the patient may be already heading into an impending respiratory failure because they are past the time that they were tachypneic. He may have been tachypneic at home, like in the 30s or in the 40s, but he's just getting tired. And you're, what you're going to see on your flow sheet is totally different from how the patient looks. So that's the point I'm trying to make. Always go and see your patients, even though you have a normal flow sheet. Then you go and examine your patient. Obviously, he has some bilateral wheezes some left edema, as everybody else. And uh, it's slightly somnolent, but still follows some commands. That's all you get. So this is not uncommon to happen. You're not going to have an x-ray. You're not going to have any labs. Actually, most commonly happens in the ER. But in the ICU, sometimes happens. And you just examine your patient. You just watch your patient. And you just heard that he was a prior smoking a smoker. So at the end of the day, for any case that you have, either from the MICU or from internal medicine, you have to try to summarize your patient in one line. So it can give you an idea what the differential diagnosis is going to be. And you can summarize this pretty basic case on an elderly patient with severe wheezes on severe respiratory distress, right? And then here comes law number one of the ICU, which makes it different for patients in the office, for patients in the wards meaning you have to take in consideration by the time you make a differential diagnosis, these three things. You have to have something curable, you have to have something catastrophic, and you have to have something contagious. Always keep in mind these three Cs by the time you make a differential diagnosis in the ICU only. What do you think is going on with this guy? Okay. Give me something catastrophic. Good, PE. Does it go along PE, patient with wheezes? It can. Correct, it can. And just by having this slight possibility that it can, which is going to be very small, right? But still, it's present in the ICU at least. And just keep this in mind. In the ICU at least, you have to keep it there. You have to remain broad. You want to, you may not want to act at that point, meaning therapy-wise, right away with heparin, but you may want to keep it in the back of your mind, down the road, during the night, depending what your initial therapy, if the, your initial therapy works or it doesn't work, so you can start the second thing. But again, that's the whole point I'm trying to make. You have to keep stuff curable, 
under your therapy, stuff catastrophic under it, and obviously something contagious. So then you make this list. COPD, CHF exacerbation, something curable, something easy to treat. Pneumonia, right? Patient may have wheezes, and patient with pneumonia may have wheezes. Yes, I mean, the first thing that's going to come to your mind is COPD, but still. Uh, flu, something contagious. You may want to put this patient in droplets precautions. And a PE. So just remember that the approach for patients in the ICU are totally different for patients in the ward, for patients in the office. That's the first difference. Now, you just saw this patient. You don't have anything at this point. You just inspect the patient and you know that the patient is having some respiratory distress. Actually, not just some. He's using mu uh, accessory muscles. He's not breathing that much. He's gasping for air. That means impending or respiratory failure. Respiratory failure equals therapy mechanical ventilation. And I don't want to use the term therapy for mechanical ventilation. I better use the term as a bridge therapy because that's what it is. Mechanical ventilation is just support only. That's it. In the meantime, you get your proper therapy to be started so you can get the patient out of the vent breathing okay as they were before. That's the whole point. Don't put the patient on the vent and they just leave it alone. They're going to do okay by the day after, but you may have not changed anything at all about what's going on because he's going to be at the same um, at the same place as before. So try to think mechanical ventilation as a bridge therapy only. Now, when I first started, I thought mechanical ventilation equal an ET tube and a mechanical ventilator, but it's not. You can use a non-invasive mechanical ventilation, which is this picture on your right. That's a BiPAP machine. Uh, when do you use it? There is three conditions that has been already pre-specified for the use of a BiPAP. You cannot use it on any respiratory failure. The most common ones though are covered, meaning a patient with COPD as this guy that you're gonna put right now on a BiPAP, right? Second thing, patients who are immunosuppressed having infiltrates, meaning having pneumonia, it has been proven that it helps lowering mortality and lowering rate of intubations for these two only. Talking about CHF exacerbation is less clear, very less clear. There is an article from JAMA saying this helps lowering mortality, lowering intubation, but there is an article from the New England that it pretty much puts it equally to the other ones. So do we use it? Yes. It is appropriately the indication, evidence-based, that is going to get my patient lowering mortality or lowering the rate of intubation down the road anyway on this patient. Unfortunately, not. So if your patient has COPD, as we thought about, you're going to put the patient on a BiPAP, right? Two things, contraindications for BiPAP. Number one is altered mental status. You want the patient to cooperate with the mass, to cooperate with breathing and exhaling with the pressures of the mass. And number two, you want to be 100% sure that the patient is still protecting airway because if your concern is airway protection, what the mass is going to do is not going to prevent your oral cavity secretions to go backwards because that's the whole point about isolating the trachea. It's about not having your contaminated oral secretions go backwards and produce a pneumonia. That's why you intubate and put an ET tube with the cuff inflated to isolate the whole airway system. Um, so if your patient is not cooperating with you, meaning it's very, very somnolent, barely having a gag, you may not want to go with a BiPAP. Now, if you have a patient who is having severe hemoptysis or her severe hematemesis, let's say any stage liver disease, having a variceal bleeding, patient may be still cooperating with you. The patient may have some severe respiratory distress, but by the time you put the mask on with this patient, what's going to happen? He's going to start vomiting everything is going to go backwards with the positive pressure that the mask is going to put on. So just make sure that you don't need airway protection down the road on a patient with BiPAP. Your patient is supposed to have either one out of those three things that I just put below, and your patient is supposed to be still awake and following some commands, having a good gag, period. So this guy apparently was somnolent, but still able to follow some commands. You check on a gag, the patient was still having a good gag. You think that this patient may have a COPD exacerbation, so pretty much meets the criteria. Very simple, you put the patient on a bite. Now, the artist is going to come to you and she's going to ask you what settings you want the patient on. 
Very simple. BiPAP, it means by level pressure. So you're going to have two pressures only. That's it. IPAP and EPAP. IPAP, inspiratory pressure. EPAP, expiratory pressure. The first one goes with ventilation. Second one goes with oxygenation. Breathing physiology. It's all about ventilating, removing CO2, oxygenating, getting O2. So once you meet those two criteria, then you can get to oxygenate and ventilate your patient better. 10 over 5. 10 of IPAP, 5 of EPAP. Standard. You're not going to get wrong. The RT comes to you asking you what settings you want the patient, just say 10 over 5. You're going to be fine. A standard for 99% of the patients. Unless your patient has some OSA, OHS, and that's okay, your resident will take care of it. But just for you guys, 10 over 5 or 99% of the patients, they're going to do fine. So, till this point, we didn't have any labs, we didn't have any x-rays, we didn't do anything but just examine the patient and taking a look at the patient. And we already made, number one, a diagnosis, which was respiratory failure, and we already put the patient on therapy. We didn't need anything else because respiratory failure is a clinical diagnosis. You don't need anything else. And to start therapy, you don't need anything else, not even an ABG. So whenever you have a patient with severe respiratory distress, if you have the luxury of time to take an ABG, fine, because that's gonna define what your respiratory failure is, either hypercapnic, higher CO2, ventilator pro ventilation problems, respiratory failure, or a hypoxic respiratory failure. That's it. If you cannot do it, that's fine. You're going to put the patient on the BiPAP anyway, and that's going to save lives. Later on, you can get your ABG, but in this case, you got the ABG at the same time you put the BiPAP on. And what do you see? Respiratory. Correct. So respiratory acidosis. So you can label this patient as having hypercapnic respiratory failure, although he's kind of hypoxic. I mean, he's not there yet, meaning lower than 60 for PO2, but definitely this guy is hypoxic. So you can say this is a combined respiratory failure, right? You put the patient on the BiPAP, and this is and the second thing in the ICU that things are very dynamic, very dynamic. It's not like in the wards or in the office that you just give the patient some therapy and you don't see the patient till the day after or in three weeks in the office. You have to put the patient on some therapy and then you need to get results in 30 to an hour. So you put the patient on the BiPAP with 10 over five, everybody's gonna be agree with you. But you need to make sure that those settings that you put the patient on are the right ones for him. So you recheck in another ABG to see how the CO2, which is pretty much ventilation, what you want to do for the patient, is doing. How often you repeat it? You give 30 minutes to an hour. You're never going to get wrong saying, put the patient on a BiPAP, then over five, give me an ABG in an hour or 30 minutes. Everybody's going to be okay with you. So you get a second ABG or what do you see? very mild to none. What you would like actually to have is your pH to reach at least 7.3, lowering maybe your CO2, but that's about it. And we didn't get it yet. You barely have a 7.2 and PCO2 is on 70. What would you do if the RT comes to you asking you, what do we do now? Good. What else? Correct. So you need to remove more CO2, right? So you just go higher. How much? Just give me a number. Five. Five over five? Well, up five. 15. Good. So that's what you do. Simple. You're never going to get wrong saying that to the RT, and the RT is going to do it. Then you get your x ray. Because, as I said, happens commonly. You already made a diagnosis. You already put the patient on therapy. Your patient is breathing fine. And then down the road, you're going to get all the labs because sometimes that happens. And you don't need it anyway, at least for initial therapy. You get the x-ray and what do you see? You don't see any infiltrates. You don't see any pleural effusion. But you see some hyperlucency on the apices compared to the lower lobes. And you thought about COPD, right? This guy is a heavy smoker. This can be a COPD kind of x-ray. Then you get all the labs, and then you have a mildly increased y -com. That's fine. You have a hemoglobin, which is high. You're never going to get a hemoglobin like this on a normal patient. Patient may have been hypoxic for quite a while, meaning having some high hemoglobins goes along with COPD. You have a BMP of 50. 
50 is your cutoff, the highest lower likelihood ratio for CHF exacerbation, right? You guys remember that? And you have an x-ray that doesn't tell you the patient has any pulmonary edema, so that's out of the question. And you have some trolls, but that's okay, everybody has some trouble. leave. You have CKD. So, again, this is just a bridge therapy. If you put the patient on the BiPAP, patient is breathing better, we need to do something actively. You need to start doing something to try to get this patient out of the BiPAP. So he can eat, right, or being a normal person. So you put the patient on naps, you start um, doing some IV medication because you don't want a patient to eat because this patient is not out of the woods yet. He may end up intubated. So you don't want this patient to vomit at the same time you're intubating the patient. So these two things are very important here in the ICU compared to the works. You have to be very careful on what's supposed to happen next. Because again, primary concept, you have to remain broad about what can happen with your patient. Things can go wrong and things are very dynamic, unfortunately. So you're gonna keep your patient MPO just in case and you're trying to get some IV access because in case your patient needs to be intubated, if you don't have IV access, you're getting serial serious problems because you need to give some sedation to the patient the patient's not going to wait for you to get IV access to get sedation the patient can crash just right away so at this point you have the luxury of time let's say your patient's on the bipap bleeding okay you're going to do these things in the meantime and the nurse comes to you five hours later it's 10 20 and she gives you next vitals your patient's on the bipap what do you see This is slightly more tachypneic, right? It's 35. It's more uh, tachycardic, it's 130. And he's deciding even on 15 over 5 on the BiPAP. Having fevers too. So, till this point, we barely had an x-ray. We don't know what's going on right now because how happens that the patient was doing okay and all of a sudden he just went down. We don't know yet. But that doesn't mean that his diagnosis doesn't is not the same. He's still in respiratory failure and you need to do something about it. You don't need anything else to make an intervention. You don't even need an ABG to make an intervention. You may want to do it, that's fine, but just if you have time. Three indications for intubation. If you have a patient deciding, even though they are on BiPAP or non rebreather, whatever you want to do. If your patient is on needs some airway protection and that's going to be very common to happen in the ICU, in the wards, in the ER, and you're gonna have a patient totally attended for whatever encephalopathy is going on, or a stroke, let's say, just to give you some examples, let's say your patient is pretty much uremic or hasn't taken any lactulose in like uh, three months and patient is having hepatic encephalopathy, they're gonna be standing okay sometimes, nearly 95, 94%, you're gonna say why he needs to be under mechanical ventilation. It's not that they need mechanical ventilation for ventilation or oxygenation purposes, it's that they need to have the trachea isolated because what I just told you, you don't want the oral secretions to go backwards, period. So a second point is airway protection, if you need it to intubate the patient, or if your patient is in severe respiratory distress, you need to intubate the patient unless you're doing something actively that you think is going to get this patient out of the problem right away. Meaning, let's say you have a patient in the wards with CHF exacerbation, two liters of oxygen, all of a sudden they go into a normal breather. Let's go into Ventimas, 40%. Patient is having some tachypnea, but if you, that doesn't mean that you're going to intubate the patient right away, right? As long as you have time, you can maybe start some diuresis, some lysis, and go for it and wait. However, if you cannot do that, meaning that for some reason there is something else going on with the patient that you're not going to be able to fix right away, you may want to intubate the patient. So you decide to intubate the patient. And the second thing that the RT is going to ask you, it's going to come to you, and she's going to ask you what mode you want the patient on under mechanical ventilation. So there are several modes of ventilation. Actually, five are the most common ones. However, 95, almost all actually, of your patients in the ICU, except one or two maybe out of 18, just to give you an example, 
uh, they're going to be in another mode of mechanical ventilation. This is universal. This is not just in this hospital, everywhere. And I bet you that if you ended up with a patient in the ICU, they're going to be under this mode more than 90% of the time. Volume control ventilation. Nationwide, universally, everywhere. We prefer volume control ventilation. And that's the only one you guys need to be very familiarized because no matter what patient you have, you're never going to get wrong saying to the RT, put the patient on volume control ventilation, period. That's it. Nobody's going to tell you, oh, no. So this is what you're going to see on your ventilator. Your ventilator has three scalars. It's going to give you a flow, volume, and pressure time scalar. So volume control ventilation, and actually you can differentiate all of the modes of ventilation by how your curve is doing on this scalar is by, sorry, taking a look here, your flow is supposed to be a constant thing under volume control. Why you give your total tidal volume? It remains constant, the flow, for you to give the total tidal volume that you want to give to the patient because the RT is going to ask you how much tidal volume you want to give the patient. A liter, half a liter, two liters, that's fine. The machine is going to give it to you on a constant flow. That's what volume control is. The dependent variable is going to be the pressure that the machine is sensing from the patient because the machine is not working on a pressure mode. It's working on a flow volume control. The machine just cares about delivering whatever volume you want to give to the patient and the pressure that it's going to sense from the patient is going to be dependent on how much volume you want to give to the patient. So it's going to defer how this curve is going to go. Volume control is not that. It's actually more than that. What it does is that gives a total breath for a patient whenever the patient triggers the vent. The patient is able to trigger the vent and then the vent is going to give you the full support, it's going to give you the full tidal volume and the full flow that you want to give to this patient. But it's going to work on a sense that if for some reason the patient doesn't want to breathe, the patient is so that it's just apneic, it's not breathing at all, for whatever reason, vents overdose, whatever, the machine is still going to give him some breaths a preset number of breaths that you're going to determine. So the patient is all covered. If the patient wants to breathe, that's fine. The machine is going to help him. If the patient doesn't want to breathe, that's fine. The machine is going to do it still. So work both ways. So you need to be totally familiar with this ventilation mode. Flow and volume constant, pressure dependent variable gives you a total support if the patient is breathing or not. Now, the second thing that the uh, RT is going to ask you is what about the settings? You already have the mode, but you need to work on the settings. So there are four settings that the RT is going to ask you, and that's it. Very simple. Again, you're never going to get wrong if you tell her or tell him these settings. You initiate with 100% FiO2, and then down the road you start titrating that lower. You want to start with 5 of PIP. And you want to start with a tidal volume in between 6 to 8 ml per K per ideal body weight. Doesn't matter the weight that the patient has because you want to know how your lungs or how a normal lung is supposed to be depending on the height. That's why it comes into a place, this concept about ideal body weight. And your respiratory rate, if you set it at 14, that's fine. So if you Tell your RT for an unknown patient that you want 100% FiO2, 5 of PIP, 400 tidal volumes, ML, and uh, 14 of respiratory rate, everybody's going to tell you, okay, you're never going to get wrong with that. Okay, this is a standard everywhere. Now, FiO2 and PIP, oxygenation, the same thing, as I said before, EPAP. And IPAP is going to be your ventilation, meaning you work on your tidal volume and you work on respiratory rate to get your ventilation better. As higher you get these numbers, meaning your tidal volume and your respiratory rate, you're going to get to ventilate, remove CO2 on a patient. If you want to get your oxygen better, your PO2 and your ABG, you need to go higher on your FiO2 and on your P. Okay?
pretty basic kind of uh, principles and that's going to help you out throughout your IC rotation. You guys know what PIP is? So that's what it is. It's pretty much just leaving some sort of pressure by the time the, 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 the machine breathes for you. It's supposed to leave some positive pressure in your alveoli. And here comes into a place this term that you're going to hear a lot, which is called recruitment. What recruitment is, is pretty much having some alveoli recruitment, meaning getting your alveoli from here to there. And by PIP, what are you going to do? You want to oxygenate the patient better. So if you leave some pressure there, your alveoli are going to be recruited, they're going to be inflated, and then you're going to oxygenate your patient better. That's the whole concept about PEEP. So it's um, you intubated the patient. Uh, you have this new vitals right now going on. Your patient is slightly tacky, but now it's slightly hypotensive now for sure. And it's still, it's still having a fever. So in the ICU, you have to have real numbers. And I'm not saying that the numbers you get from the cuff are unreal, but you have to be 100% sure that your patient is really hypotensive to start some sort of therapy. And what I'm talking about is not just IV fluids. What I'm talking about is about vasopressors. There's many problems with vasopressors that you, wanna, you do not want to get in meaning ischemia, right? So unless you truly don't need it, don't start it. If you do need it, that's fine, but you need to be 100% sure that the patient's blood pressure is real. The one from the cuff gives you an idea, but you are gonna have some sort of patients, any stage liver disease, any stage renal disease, vasculopaths, that your blood pressure that you're gonna get on the cuff is totally different from what you, the one that you get on an arterial line. Do you guys know what an arterial line is? It's this. It's pretty simple. You just do an ABG, you put a transducer in, and then you start getting the numbers, light waves, from the arterial pulse. And then it gives you the accurate blood pressure. In the meantime, what you're going to do is just give IV fluids to the patient. Patient hypotensive, give IV fluids. Fine. Done. In the meantime, you get this whole thing set up. Because you don't want to start vasopressors unless you're completely sure that the patient is hypotensive if you don't want an arterial line. So the indication for an arterial line, pretty much a patient who is hypotensive, despite IV fluids, let's say it that way. Number two, if you need to start any very strong medications for it, meaning vasopressors, so you don't get into problems. And number two, meaning hypertensive emergency, because again, you're using very strong um, medications for it. Uh, so you want to have an accurate blood pressure. And if, and then you're going to see this with practice, if you intubate a patient and you would say that this patient is going to remain on the ventilator for quite a while because you need to get to the best settings possible on the ventilator, you may need to, um, you may need to uh, do several APGs and you don't want to poke the patient many times, so better you just do an arterial line and be done with that. Pretty much simple. Those are the indications for your arterial line and you're going to place it on this patient, right? Because he's hypotensive. So, this is your arterial line blood pressure, which correlates with the one from the cuff, and your patient is still hypotensive. It's still having a fever. You made your interventions already, meaning that you intubated the patient, you diagnosed that the patient was having a respiratory failure, and obviously you didn't have the time to get an x-ray, but now you're doing it because all of a sudden this guy who was totally okay with a not normal x-ray, but let's say no infiltrates x-ray before, just went down, even though he was fine on a BiPAP, meaning some sort of mechanical ventilation. You get another x-ray and this is what you see, bilateral infiltrates, which wasn't there five hours before. And that's the thing about the ICU, it's a very dynamic setting. Unfortunately, this thing happens. And now you get new labs and you have a Wycan, which is even higher for what it was, now it's 15, on a patient having a fever, what comes to your mind? ARDS. ARDS, what else? We're gonna talk about it, sepsis. So your patient now is septic. You have serious criteria, and you may have a source. You just took a look at the x-ray, right? There's some bilateral infiltrates. So this term, sepsis-induced tissue hyperperfusion, is a new term that you need to be 100% sure is happening or not on your patient who is septic. 
because it's not just semantics. If you have this diagnosis, you're supposed to do, to do something different. And whoever named or created this term is Dr. Rivers. It's early goal direct therapy. That's what's going to differentiate your management on a patient septic from the other ones. On is either if you have a high lactate, more than four, lactate that's a hypoperfusion marker, or if you have hypotension despite IV fluids, either one or the other. You have a patient who has high lactate, you're supposed to do this. It's pretty much base, or it's uh, even more applied, I would say, let's call it that way, in the ER, because it was created for ER patients without prior interventions, and it decreased mortality by 15%, which is a lot. Do we use it in the ICU? Yes, we do. And actually, it's part of our sepsis guidelines. So you need to be very cognizant that if you have a patient in the ICU, those are not just whatever patient, they are very sick. So you need to make sure you have a lactate that you're gonna order, and you need to make sure you have an arterial line telling you real blood pressure and telling you that the patient is still having low blood pressure despite all the IV fluids that you put on the patient. Now, early goal directed therapy, it's all about number one, antibiotics. It's the first thing you guys need to remember, you have a patient who is septic, who has a high lactate or who is still hypotensive, you need to call the sepsis line at least on this hospital because the first and the most important thing about this whole bundle, the safe lives, 50% decreased mortality is getting your antibiotics right away. So once you get your antibiotics right away, once you start the patient on some IV fluids, once you try to get your arterial blood pressure a little bit higher, then you can start working on your other markers, meaning your CVP, your lactate, and your SVO2. Those are resuscitation markers that you need to be kind of familiarized by the time you get into the ICU. How do you get these markers? Is by putting a central line. And that's how, that's why I'm going to tell you what the indication for a central line is. In this particular patient, is because number one, you need to use vasopressors. Can you use it with a peripheral line? Yes, in a case of an emergency, you can. It's not safe though. It'd be better if you use a central line for it. So if you have a patient who is pretty much hypotensive and you don't have anything around, not even a central kit, that's fine, you can use it. Sometimes we have to use it on patients who are gold blue on the wards, but you may wanna start working on a central line because of the adverse effects of vasopressors. Number two, if you don't have any IV access whatsoever, I mean, pretty much the patient doesn't have any peripherals at all and there is no way to get it, just or some sort of IV access, you can do an IV uh, central line. And number three, for your resuscitation, surrogates, markers, parameters, however you want to call it, which is pretty much these last three things that I just mentioned before, meaning your central venous pressure, meaning your lactate from a central source, not peripheral source, and your SVO2 from a central source, not peripheral. So if you ask me, can I get these three things from a peripheral line? Yes, you can, but they're not going to be good enough to try to guide you therapy on a patient who's septic and hypoperfusing and in shock as this patient. So you put the patient on antibiotics and um, these are the vitals. And the things that you want to be cognizant about is try to have a meaningful good mean arterial pressure that you're going to get by your arterial line, right? And if the nurse comes to you and asks you what vasopressor you want to start, you're never going to get wrong on a septic patient at least to use levofed slash noriprinephrine. That's fine. That's the standard of care is the preferred one on patients septic. So again, you have a hypotensive patient, you start the fluids, you start the art line, you see the patient's hypotensive, and if the nurse comes to you asking you for a vasopressor, just start norepinephrine. Standard of care everywhere. Then you're gonna start working on your central line, right? To try to, in, first of all, in, in, put your vasopressors on. And number two, for resuscitation markers, which is pretty much your CVP, which your goal is gonna be more than eight to 10. Your lactate, try to get it lower than four and your SVO2 try to get it higher than 70% as much as you can. Are you gonna find them all on a patient? Not necessarily, but that's your goal at the end of the day.
So somebody said ARDS, which is true. I mean, you have a patient who's septic, which who has a new X-ray, which is totally different from what it was before. And what's the definition for ARDS? It's different from what it was before. It just came out in 2012. This is the Berlin definition, 2012, which differs from the one from the 1994, I guess. Because now it just asks you for three things only. An acute onset, lower than seven days. This patient had it in about hours. Second thing, you're supposed to have bilateral infiltrates, as you have it here. And the third thing, you don't have to have a strong feeling only, that's the only thing they ask you, about heart failure in this patient. That's it. Meeting all those three, you have ARDS. How is this going to change your management? It's going to change a lot, actually. With this, the whole idea about this new Berlin definition is that then they did later studies, and they figured out that by differentiating the patient into mild, moderate, or severe ARDS, this correlates better to mortality compared to the prior definition. The prior definition, which included acute lung injury, ALI, the dozen, it's not there anymore. It's just not there in the dictionary anymore. So just forget about it if you learn it at some point. It's just differentiating between mild, moderate, or severe. It correlates better with mortality. And this is the new definition for ARDS only. You may have heard maybe about a wedge pressure that they asked you before. That thing is gone. That's the prior definition. So this is what I mean as uh, it's going to totally change your management because for ARDS, you may want to have your patient in the lung protective zone, this green zone right there. How you're going to get your patient into that zone? By two things, trying to lower atelic trauma. What atelic trauma is making your alveoli to have some positive pressure there so it doesn't collapse at the time the patient is having an inspiration or expiration on the vent because if the walls of the alveoli touch each other, what's going to happen is more inflammation and the patient's already having inflamed lungs so you don't want this to get any worse so what you're going to do is try to keep some positive pressure at the end of expiration so the alveoli wall do not collapse so that's what it calls it's, it's, it's not producing more atelic trauma now volute trauma volute in the past 1980s we used to use high high tidal volumes Tidal volume is the total volume that you're going to give to the patient. It was 10 ml per K, 12 ml per K. They figure out that this is not good for the patient. You're supposed to be very conservative on the amount of volume that you give to this patient. So if you put the patient on 8 ml per K, you may want to drop it to 6 ml per K. So this is the whole concept about ARDS management. Lower your tidal volumes, lower the total amount of volume that you're going to give to the patient so you can decrease volume trauma, meaning expanding the lungs so much so you don't get ARDS any worse, meaning more inflammation, and trying to leave some positive pressure on the alveoli so they don't collapse at all. That's ARDS management. So you prevent volume trauma by that, you prevent intellect trauma by that, having some PIP. And the third thing is trying to decrease your oxygen toxicity. And you're gonna do it by lowering your FiO2. But again, if you lower your FiO2, what's gonna happen? Your patient may get a little bit more hypoxic, right? But then you have the other thing, which is actually recommended, is trying to go higher on your PIP. And that's gonna balance the idea about oxygenating your patient. And the fourth thing is trying to, get, to have a restricted fluid management because you already have inflamed lungs you give fluid to this patient, it's just going to pour out third space, you're going to have a worsening pulmonary edema and obviously worsening oxygenation. So your nurse comes to you and now she tells you that your patient is slightly better. I mean, it's starting okay. It's afibrile. So the way that you're going to present this patient to your staff the day after is, number one, the patient is septic, right? You started antibiotics right away? Good, because that's the whole point about early goal directed therapy, at least for patients in the ICU. Number three, he may want to know how much pressure support, if the patient is on pressors, how much they are on, and your resuscitation markers. This is how you're supposed to present a patient because it's very important to know how your CVP, your central venous pressure is on by your central line because you're going to already have it and how the lactate is doing, how your urine output is doing because it's another surrogate for resuscitation and your SVO2.
And the second thing is ARDS. You're going to say, yeah, this patient is on the ARDS, and he may want to know how your lung protective strategies are, which are the ones that I already mentioned, which is trying to lower your tidal volumes, try to get higher on your respiratory rate if for whatever reason you need it, because again, what happens if you lower your tidal volumes? You're going to have, unfortunately, some CO2 retention. How you can equilibrate for it? Well, you have the vent. You can go higher on the respiratory rate and try to remove all this CO2 that unfortunately is not getting removed because you're lower, you have lower tidal volumes. And that's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm trying to get on higher pips. So as you can see, for example, on this ABG, the first one, you have this patient with a pH of 7.3, a pCO2 of 70. Unfortunately, regardless, you need to start lung protective strategies. This is a patient with ARDS. So you're going to lower the tidal volumes. You're going to try to get higher on the respiratory rate just to manage the CO2 that is already kind of high. And this is what you get, unfortunately. Is this ABG looking better than the old one? It's not, right? So you have a PCO2, which is even higher. Your patient is on the vent. And you have a PO2 though that is looking a little bit better, and I would feel better about it. So that's how we ended up with this term that you're going to hear a lot in the ICU, which is called permissive hypercapnia. This has been already proven on patients with ARDS, that by doing these modalities, meaning lowering your tidal volume, they're going to get hypercapnic. But guess what? It's fine. They're going to do okay. This is protective, actually. If they get hypercapnic, that's fine. That's why. That's how it's called permissive hypercapnia. Actually, you want to get to this point. You may want to get your patient a little bit hypercapnic because that means that you are truly reducing your tidal volumes. That's the whole point about ARDS. They ask you for one thing and only that you are supposed to do on ARDS patients is to lower your tidal volumes no matter what period. The number, if you can remember it, 6 ml per K. 6. That's it. Or 5 ml body weight. Uh, and this is very important because unfortunately, even though this thing has been up for 20 years, I would say, it's still not done totally nationwide. There has been surveys actually trying to figure out if patients with ARDS, if they've been on protective lung strategies that has been already proven to decrease mortality. And unfortunately, not everybody is doing it, unfortunately, uh, for whatever reason. So um, we get into day three. And your patient was on ARDS. You try to uh, work on your ventilator, trying to make sure that the patient develops this permissive hypercapnia that I just told you about. It's fine as long as you have lower tidal volumes. The patient is oxygenation well. I mean, you go higher on the PEEP. That's fine too. But then you get to the point that the patient may not need the vent anymore and you may want to do the final thing, meaning trying to stubate the patient. That's the whole point about mechanical ventilation, right? It's just a bridge therapy again. You don't want to keep your patient on the ventilator for so long because then you get in troubles. I'm not going to get that. But uh, anyhow, what your staff is going to ask you is, first of all, if you want to be your patient, it's going to ask you if, if the patient is on minimal ventilator settings. What minimal ventilator settings means is having an FiO2 of 40%. You have your patient on FiO2 of 40%, that's great. If you have your patient with a PIP of 5 because you didn't need higher PIPs for oxygenation, if you get to 5, that's fine. You don't treat x-rays. You just treat how the patient is doing. I, I'm presenting you actually the first initial x-ray just to give you an idea that the patient is doing better. But if the x-ray is still not looking that good, that's fine. You're just treating the patient. So as long as the patient has an FiO2 of 40%, PIP of 5, you can tell, yes, the patient is on minimal ventilator settings. Second thing your staff is going to ask you if is the patient hemodynamically stable meaning that the patient doesn't need any vasopressors, meaning that the patient is not in shock. A shock, it's a really strong word. So you don't want to be a patient who's in shock. So that's number two. And number three, again, the primary concept, making sure that your patient can still be awake and protecting airway. Because if your patient, no matter the other two, is still not protecting airway, you don't want to be the patient. 
again, all the URL secretions are going to go backwards and you're going to end up with the same problem later on. If you meet all these three criteria, then you're going to hear a lot about this term, which is the rapid shallow breathing index. Discover 1990s by Tobin, which is pretty much this. It's very simple. Getting your patient on minimal ventilator support and getting an idea how his respiratory rate over his own tidal volumes on the machine that is going to give you are lower than 105. If this number gets any lower, it's even better. As long as you have lower than 105 and your patient is again on minimal ventilator settings, awake and hemodynamically stable, you can tell that this is a, an algorithm from the New England. As long as you have an SVT mean a spontaneous breathing trial, as long as your spontaneous breathing trial, as long as you keep the patient like this for 30 minutes, and as long as he's awake and okay, you can extubate the patient. And that's it. Pretty simple.